Hey, stackers. Bet you didn't expect to hear me. For those of you new to the show, we podcast for eight weeks and then take a week to clean the basement. And actually, oh, that's such a lie. We don't clean the basement. We send the Fintern down to clean up the basement. And he's here waiting in the wings. However, I just want to stop by the microphone to say uh, I'm here to help Doug find his uh, baby blue tuxedo. You know, the one with the ruffles that he wore to junior prom because he is going to be joining us at the stack that is our greatest money show on earth live event on youtube it's this wednesday at 8 p.m eastern 5 p.m pacific it's uh money inspiration so if you're somebody that doesn't really feel inspired and that's why you come to the stacking benjamin show we're gonna bring it and we're also gonna bring some big tips and tricks to help you do better with your money and if you're here for those reasons as well we have uh two super guest and a surprise co-host the surprise co-host has an excellent financial podcast our two guests one is a big youtube star and uh, cable tv star and the other one is a big instagram star and all in uh, money adjacent areas i think that's all i'm going to say about them you'll have to be there to see who they are but that's not the only reason to come we also have just a fantastic chat window uh i feel like there's beach balls going around during the chat for the stack event so 5 p.m eastern 8 p.m pacific i did that exactly opposite 8 p.m eastern 5 p.m pacific there we go and uh stackingbenjamins.com forward slash stack so in your browser stackingbenjamins.com forward slash stack to join us hope you can all right here's the fin turn let's get this show rolling pre-recorded from joe's mom's basement Welcome to another Rewind episode of The Stacking Benjamin Show. Hey everyone, I'm Griffin the Intern, or like the guy who yells at me on my jogs likes to call me, Run, Fintern, run! Ever wonder if someone you know likes to run? Here's the answer. Kind of like that old joke about CrossFit, if they ran, believe me, you'd know. If I'm not allowed to gloat about turning off Netflix and exercising once in a while, what's really the point, right? I admit, there's a good argument to be had that not all sources of motivation are created equal. My response to that point is a timeless piece of knowledge that my dad gave me, and today I give it to you. Here it is. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. If the prospect of gloating to your friends that you've become debt-free is your source of inspiration to save and invest, then who am I to stop you? I could sit here and talk philosophy all day, but that's not why either of us are here, is it? Instead, I think you'd much rather enjoy the Rewind episode I've queued up for you. Released at the end of 2018, this episode was as relevant then as it is now. We titled it, Creating Your Debt-Free Blueprint with Laura Adams, a.k.a. The Money Girl. Whether you have some serious debt to handle or need a refresher, this one's for you. Fin turn out. How was that? Did I enunciate enough? I must stop this whole thing. Why, for 53 years I put up with it now. I must stop Christmas from coming. But how? From Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and how's your debt situation? Mine is great, by the way. Plenty to go around. Let me know if you need any. Anyway, hey, if credit agencies are dropping coal in your stocking this holiday season, don't worry about it because we got you covered. Here to help you get debt free, we welcome the money girl herself, Laura Adams. Plus, what does 2019 look like for the world of credit? We'll ask Matthew Comos, Senior Vice President of Research and Consulting at TransUnion, in our headline segment. We'll also drop the Haven Lifeline in the water for Alexander, answer a letter from the mailbag, and eh, don't worry, folks, don't worry. Tons of time left for my trivia. We'll never miss that. But now, two guys who are the top two on Santa's naughty list, Joe and O. J-J-J-J-G. They say you are who you're around, and unfortunately, I get stuck hanging out with you, so guilty by association, brother. I am not on the naughty list. Right. Trust me. You're on Mrs. OG's naughty list. 
Nope. Nope. She's not nope. giving you coal. I'm, I'm awesome. I'm the best ever. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Egomaniacs R Us podcast. <laughs> I'm Joe Salci. Hi, I'm Joe Money on Twitter. And across the card table from me, the man who uh, has a confidence problem, the one and only OG. We all do sometimes. Yep. Yes. Today's my day. It was 26 degrees running this morning, and I'm gripping my cup of coffee very, uh, very tightly today. Great news. That's going to be the high temperature for the next four months to the city where mom's moving the basement. That's what the guys were telling me. They're like, uh, you know, like, you're wait till you run when it's negative 20. You know, you're moving north, Joe. I'm like, well, thanks for the acclimatization. But I that's probably just acclimatization 101. Hey, speaking of 101, if you're somebody that has to get your debt situation taken care of, uh, Laura Adams, the Money Girl, Money Girl podcast. Uh, Laura's finally coming down to the basement. You know, everybody calls you and I the grandpas of the podcasting world. She was already a rock she star. She was podcasting years before we <laughs> even before we even thought about it. She was been a rock star for a long, long time. So it's about time we got Laura down here in the basement to talk to us with her new book about setting up your debt-free blueprint. We've got a fantastic show. You know what else is fantastic, though, OG? Any credit card can offer cash back, but only Discover matches all the cash back you've earned at the end of your first year. It's like getting one of those birthday cards that's shaped like cash. So you already know there's cash inside before opening it. But in this case, it's stuffed with your first year cash back match, and you don't even have to send a thank you note. Cash back match only by Discover card. Learn more at discover.com slash match. Discover something brighter. We got a fantastic show for you. The money girl's here. So let's get this party started. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show. Our stacking Benjamin's headlines. First headline comes to us from investment news. I love this time of year, OG, because it's prediction time. Time for people to predict, prognosticate, and uh, look in the crystal ball. Of course, Early next year, we will look in the crystal ball, a.k.a. Lens Magic 8 Ball. That's going to be some fun. Have you ever taken part in the Magic 8 Ball? I don't think you have, have you? Yeah, I have. I've been, I've been around a little while. Yeah, I've been doing this show just, just almost as long as you. Easy. But you haven't done the Friday shows for long. Did you do this year's Magic 8 Ball? Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah but you actually invited me to the Friday stuff earlier this year, and it was such a hit with everybody that oh, you were forced my, to keep me. Oh, my. Just. It just doesn't end. I'm sorry. You said I was suffering from a confidence problem. How did, your, trying to... how did your head get down that stairway this morning? <laughs> like, really? How did you do it? Well, let's see if you can put that big old noggin around these issues. 10 predictions for financial advice in 2019. This is written by Ryan W. Neal. Despite recent stock market struggles, Ryan writes, wealth management remains. Struggles. What's that? I just said struggles. I just love how people use whatever words they want. I actually saw somebody tweet the other day that the market was had crashed 8%, and now was a great time to really focus on dollar cost averaging. And it just reminded me of what we talked about last week of, yeah, it's crashed all the way up 2.5% for the year. It's just like just the selective use of data is just uh, amazing. But go ahead. Carry on. Yes. Wealth, man wealth management, though, remains one of the strongest performing sectors in financial services around the globe. According to Deloitte's 2019 Banking and Capital Markets Outlook Report, microeconomic trends, the movement toward fee-based relationships and favorable demographic shifts all give reason for continued optimism going into 2019. All right. Uh, this just kind of uh, foreshadows what's coming up. Let's just go through their predictions. Deloitte predicts that uh, the robo-advisors influence digital advice platforms may no longer be an existential threat to advisors, but they continue gathering assets and aren't going away. Deloitte believes robo-advisors will continue to introduce the advice market to new consumers, including the mass market, which could influence how products are bundled. In 2019, advice could start replacing checking or savings accounts as the core of consumer financial relationships. Do you see people with advice as their centerpiece and then a checking account that goes along with it? No, it's too, um, maybe someday, but not, not in the next year. I don't think it's no, happening next that, year that, That's replacing the, you know... 250 year old institution of banking with, with a, effectively a personal banker going here. I am the QB of all of this. And now here you can have this checking account and you should have this IRA and stuff. 
And that's the big problem in banking is people don't trust their bank. I think if people trusted their bank more, that might be the case where your banker is kind of the advisor. I could totally see banking as advisor. Yet every time banking gets in the role of advisor, they seem to get in their own way. Maybe not every time, but figure to muck it up. Yeah. Yeah. A bunch of times. Also robo advisors. I think the problem with this Deloitte data is that we still haven't seen a downturn. And I can't wait to see what happens to robos during a downturn. Well, we kind of see it at the bigger picture. And Joe, I know you're kind of interested in this too. Yeah, What people say and what people do are quite often two different things. And so you can look at the global inflows and outflows of investors and their behavior, which is the the information that Dalbar uses for their study every year of the quantitative analysis of investor behavior. And that explains why the average investor only gets like 3% a year when the average investment gets nine is because the average investor shucks and jives all the time. They go, yeah, I'm a 12 on the risk scale right now. Oh, I actually changed my mind. I'm a three. I'm a three. But they don't say they're a three after the market went up 22%. They say I'm a three after it went down 8% in a week and a half. We're already seeing that at the global level, like we're you know, big picture level where you can see the inflows and outflows of different mutual funds and stuff. It will be interesting to see profitability of companies that are already not profitable if all of a sudden, I mean, heck, even if all the clients stayed and the market went down 25%, that's going to be, you know, taking, you know, it's a company like Wealthfront or something like that. That was, I don't know, the last number I heard was 10 billion. I'm going to go from 10 billion to seven and a half or eight. That's going to affect the profitability. That's if everybody stays. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, I want it to be successful because I love the technology. I'd sure. love to have the technology that they have that I can use. And we're starting to see it in the institutional space too. Funny you say that because the next point in this study for 2019 hybrid model takes center stage. The needs for different wealth segments will continue to vary, but digitization and automation is impacting how advisors serve client segments, successfully blending high touch and personalized services with low touch automated interactions. It's going to be key to maintaining profitability for your financial advisor in 2019. That includes, I think, advisors using robos and giving your client this hybrid model. <laughs> Heard it here first. Number, well, <laughs> her, I think it's technically heard it here second. But For a second. Yes. Number three, more investments in digital client experience. Beyond digital advice, firms across the industry are likely to invest in technology to improve user experience and expand the number of tools they offer. Offering digital goals-based planning tax strategies and estate planning could be as important as investment performance. Deloitte's Mr. Vincent said, we're likely to see a lot of products currently in development launch in 2019. Advisors on their platform, giving their clients more digital tools at their disposal. Advisors are notoriously slow in technology uptake. And the ones that are constantly refreshing their tech stack, to use the parlance that tech people use, and in trying to continuously improve that client experience are going to be the ones that are kind of leading the way there. Because you are competing with, back to the robo thing, a very seamless experience at Better Mentor Wealthfront or, you know, wherever, where you enter a couple of things, you click a couple of buttons, boom, your account's open. Pretty, it might not be the most scientific analysis, but it's going, yeah, you're on track. Yeah, you got a little work to do. Yeah, you should say 500 a month. You know, if you're not able to deliver something similar to that as an advisor, you better figure out a way how to pretty quick. Our mutual friend, Ted Jenkin at uh, Oxygen Financial, I remember him coming on the show maybe five years ago. And I remember thinking that, OG, oh, exactly how far ahead of the curve is Ted? Because Ted was at that time doing exactly what we're talking about now, putting all these tools online, giving people a different experience with their financial plan. He's in the Atlanta area, by the way. And it's funny, mm -hmm. it appears Ted's five years, <laughs> five years ahead of the curve. Well, I mean, you can just look at the investment advisor surveys that different companies do. Investment News does one. There's a number of them out there. But <laughs> how many firms don't even have an actual contact management system? Yeah. I mean, like a full third or 40% don't. You know, how many people are still using spreadsheets, <laughs> you know, for financial plans? And then you contrast that against firms like Oxygen, or uh, even Edelman right now is really heavily investing in technology, yeah. you know, in their big acquisition a couple of months ago. But 
everybody is trying to get the experience online. Heck, we're doing it. Study progress toward fiduciary is the next one <laughs> in 2019. Nope. Department of Labor's fiduciary rule may be dead, but the Securities and Exchange Commission's best interest standards is on the way. Around the world, regulators are moving toward a fiduciary model. While advisors are aware of the shift, there remains a great deal of uncertainty of when they will be forced to comply with the mandated standard, Mr. Vincent said. I think I think there is still a drumbeat in that. I think that's the direction we're headed. I still think it says steady progress toward. doesn't say we're going to get it. Steady progress toward. I agree no. with that. Well, there won't be any movement in it next year, maybe globally, but in the United States, the industry, the commission side of the industry is so strong with lobbyists and they have so much money that anything related to tamping down that gravy train of commissions is met with very, very, very stiff legislative restriction because of all the money. It's really quite obnoxious. You can see just this year, for example, as the Department of Labor ruling kind of evaporated in the last two thirds of the year, since it became very evident, oddly enough, sales of fixed indexed annuities went skyrocketingly high. Back again. Weird. How did that happen? After last year, they went through the floor. Oh, they're down like 30%. Yeah. And again, yep, there's uses for them. We got it. Don't write us in. Here's the here's the other side of that. The next prediction for 2019 is fighting fee compression because of uncertainty around regulations. Many advisors are likely to continue operating a commission business alongside a fiduciary accounts to fight fee compression. Advisors could focus on attaining more discretionary mandates with higher margins. So what they're saying is advisors are seeing fee compression on the advisory platform on the advisory side as those fees continue to go down and they're countering it by saying, Hey, I'm going to open up all these commission based activities on the side that you can also do that are kind of add ons to my fee business. It's funny because people think, and I'm just going to get on my step stool here for a second. People think that cheaper advisor equals better. And look at what's happening as people drive fees down in what area they reappear in other areas. It's like, I feel like you're putting your hands over over these holes in in a pipe. It's like a it's like a cartoon rowboat where you like put one thumb in <laughs> yeah. and then the pops another another water spigot pops up. Exactly. You put thumb in that one and another spigot pops up somewhere else. And is this is this actually better or worse? You know, it's in, in some ways I think it's worse because your advisor now wants to sell you a bunch of add-on products just so they can make a living doing what they do. It it it's ugliness. Well interestingly about this concept of fee compression, it's, uh, there's a lot of studies that support the fact that it's actually not happening, despite the fact that the alternative space for what we mentioned at the beginning of Wealthfront, Betterment, and those places, you know, having an effect, but rather those companies are bringing in new client dollars. And while there are certainly investors that are moving from one platform to the other, you know, a full service advisor to lower tier type of service model, it's actually having an effect of bringing in new consumers. So most advisor firms are not having to deal with that too much, surprisingly, but it is something that's on the radar for a lot of people. Next up, and I won't have time to go through all these, but except in passing, but boosting price transparency. I think we're just going to see that a lot in the annuity business, especially much more price transparency, I think, coming to insurance products. Next is uh, continued growth in data analytics and AI. Do you know that uh, in some countries, they've banned commissions altogether, except for if the client signs off on it. And so if you are selling an insurance product that has a commission attached to it, you have to write, not that I'm getting a commission, but you have to say, if you invest this million dollars into this fixed annuity, my commission is $60,000 today and $10,000 each year for the next three years. Press hard three copies. In like big, bold letters. Is that good or bad? Yes. It's great if you are a consumer. <laughs> it's not so great if you're a guy that used to sell a bunch of But I think uh, about that, products. you know, there's that type of stuff with houses now, right? With real estate transactions, they make them put that right in black and white, but it gets lost because you're Did you signing, see it on yours? You're signing 60. I did see it, but you're signing, but it's, it's partly because I know where to look, but you're signing yeah. 60,000 documents at once. 
all these well, disclosures, I, which by the way, signing 60,000 disclosures in one, one hour sitting makes yeah, the purpose does not make of the, it d- d- does not give you disclosure. <laughs> there is no disclosure. Especially yeah. when you said, probably like I said, when I bought my house, could you please send me those forms in advance so that I could read them? And uh, yeah, they didn't come. I actually just uh, put an offer on, on another rental property and it was a real low ball offer. So I knew it was going to get through, or at least I didn't think it was going to. But my realtor, the first time that I had done a deal with her, you know, they've got their agreement, right? Where you've got, you know, you, you contract with the realtor. She had put down that our contract expired 1231 of 2020. <laughs> okay. That's a little excessive. And I said, this was in August. I said, well, no, let's do like four months. We'll do the rest of the year. She said, oh, okay, fine. So she changed it to 1231, 2018. So this last deal, when I sent the forms in, she changed it again to 1231, 2019. But she changed it again to 630, 2019. So she added like six months on the back end, which I thought was fine, except for the fact that she wrote the date wrong and put 6-30-2018. So I'm like, okay, yeah, I can sign that. <laughs> she just, our contract's technically over now. <laughs> but but you're right. I was thinking about it as I was going through. Like, how many of these, and it was DocuSign, which makes it even, you know. Did she point that out or just changed it? Oh, just changed it. That's horrible. Yeah. Click, 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 done. Yeah. Uh, modernizing the back office is next. I think a lot of practices... Uh, did that, but the, a big one here in the end, that, yeah. aging populations, driving opportunity for advisors, which a I lot think of fixed annuity sales, yep. <laughs> which I think is, is absolutely true. And then last opportunities in Asia. So if you want to move to Asia, uh, there's a huge, mm. apparently a huge, oh my gosh, expansion of the entrepreneur class in Asia right now. So if you have, if you have the ability to learn or to speak pretty fluent Chinese. I've read several articles of investment advisory firms that are chomping at the bit to get people to move to Asia because, you know, what's it like every day another hundred millionaires are made in China or something like that? I mean, it's such an astronomical growth rate, you know, in terms of their, uh, the overall net worth of the economy, so to speak, that uh, they can't keep up. In our second headline, as we close in on the end of the year, it's increasingly prognostication time, isn't it? Well, somebody who knows credit more than most people here with the 2019 look into the credit crystal ball on my dad's shortwave is Matt Como, Senior Vice President of Research and Consulting for TransUnion. How are you, Matt? Doing great, Joe. Thanks for having me on the show. Well, you guys, for 2019, it's all doom and gloom in the news every day, but then I open up your 2019 report you guys have kind of a glasses half full look going on. Yeah, you know, based on what we're expecting in the overall consumer credit marketplace, we think things are looking healthy. And overall, it's good news for the consumer. In total, we're expecting things to continue to grow in personal loans and auto lending. We're going to see a little bit of a pullback in mortgage. And a lot of that's due to interest rates and um, really the continued rise in home prices. And we'll see a bit of tempering in the credit card market. But overall, consumers are continuing to have access to credit, and they're using that credit, and they're performing well on it. So that that really bodes well for consumers and lenders alike. Well, and I was going to ask you this, Matt, from the consumer point of view, because in your report, it says that originations and consumer balances are going to be higher. I think of higher debt balances and going to get more credit. It sounds like the average person has less money. How is that good? Well, I would say, you know, on the average, it, it really depends on a individual consumer basis. You have to kind of think about that full debt wallet with regard to, you know, how are consumers utilizing credit? What we've seen over the last few years is consumers are accessing credit as they have jobs, they have wages that are increasing. These are things that help drive the consumer credit marketplace. So we know that as consumer confidence grows, consumer spending continues. Credit becomes, you know, it's a useful way and, you know, frankly, in a lower rate environment, it becomes really a cheaper way to help fund some of those types of purchases. Now, that being said, as rates are expected to continue to rise, there is going to be some pullback, you know, and consumers need to make choices that are smart for their own wallet to understand, you know, where can they get the best deal or where can they look to get better interest rates where a HELOC might become a viable option, and that's a home equity line of credit. 
versus maybe uh, a personal loan or certain credit cards, oh. and it can be more cost effective for them. You also believe that delinquency rates are going to go down. You just mentioned more people have jobs. Is that, do uh, you think, a product of the people having more jobs that people will be paying their bills on time more? Yeah, so we definitely know that unemployment is a strong driver of performance that we see on credit products. Now, we do expect card delinquency to slightly tick up next year, and some of that has been, it's really driven by that continued access to credit that consumers have seen. But overall, really, jobs as well as you know strong wage growth and or disposable income, those are the types of things that, that really help propel consumers' ability to make payments. And so based on you know where we expect those metrics to be next year, we actually do feel that delinquencies are looking pretty good. I was actually, I, I was incredibly happy to see that even though you said that fewer people will take out mortgages because of the higher rates, the mortgage delinquencies look like they're going through the floor though. That's good news. Yeah, I mean, it's been kind of an amazing story in mortgage, and, and it's really been, you know, a recovery from the recession. Back in Q2 of 2010, uh, mortgage delinquency peaked at about 7.2%. We've just seen this continual decrease over time. Some of that was due to contraction in the marketplace, right? So it was difficult right after the recession to get a mortgage. That's opened up somewhat, but what you have today is a lot less programs available like low or no down payment type loans. And so there is still a segment of the market that isn't participating or able to participate as frequently. You couple that with kind of rising home prices and kind of rising interest rates. And so the origination side or the growth side is kind of tempered. So the delinquency picture is somewhat a function of that, right? You have uh, lower risk consumers participating and that's been driving the delinquencies further. But Again, a good news story from the perspective of some of that kind of uh, structural delinquency or things that kind of happened through the recession that's kind of been flushed out of the system. And, you know, we've, we've seen that go away for a while now and, and we've seen that continued improvement. Yeah, that's great news. When it comes to 2019, somebody's listening to you and I chat here, Matt, and they're putting their plan together. With all this data that you guys accumulated here, what's my course of action next year with my credit? So, yeah, I think it's important if I'm a consumer, first and foremost, make sure to understand your credit and, to, you know, to check it frequently, right? There's a lot of free resources available out there. Understand where you stand from a, a credit perspective. Ensure that there aren't unauthorized things being opened and really get a sense of where you sit on that risk spectrum because that helps drive lender decision making with regard to the type of rates that a consumer might get as well as what type of products might fit needs the best. The reality is consumers have a lot of tools at their disposal today, and they've shown a willingness to continue to be educated. So it's really putting that education to work and, you know, go into kind of that discussion with a lender armed as best as possible to understand what rates make sense, what type of rates you should be you know, paying for specific types of products. And oftentimes lenders are very, they're very responsive to that kind of perspective from consumers. Well, I've got a credit guy on, on the shortwave, even though it has nothing to do with this study, Matt, I've got one more question. And, and if you don't know the answer, that's perfectly fine. But obviously, sure. we, obviously, we continually see more and more credit scams and these predators are getting even more and more clever. Are we seeing some of the protections that people have put in place and entities have put in place starting to lock down our credit more, or do we have to continue to be vigilant in 2019? Yeah, so overall, you know, and this isn't necessarily my area of expertise, we do have some experts that kind of look really at the fraud and kind of identity space a lot more in detail. What I can tell you, though, is this is a continued area of focus, having tools available, like being able to lock or freeze your credit, um, really with essentially the touch of an app is a great tool for consumers. And if it works for them, it's something that they should pursue. It is important to remain vigilant um, regardless, just to ensure that your credit is in a, in a good spot. There's no unauthorized usage going on and, and, you know, really get a sense of where you're at in, in that risk spectrum. Well, I hope you and yours have a great holiday season and happy new year to you, Matt. Thanks for hanging out with us for a few minutes. Yeah, my pleasure. And uh, have a great holiday season as well. After a year of financial uncertainty, it's important 
here early in 2021 to build your financial confidence back up. And Navy Federal Credit Union understands that whether it's a deployment, your EAS day or retirement, life in the military comes with all sorts of financial challenges. And they're dedicated to helping their members regain financial stability through savings. We've talked about this a bunch, guys, but the best way to get confidence is to build yourself a good financial cushion, not to do shortcuts. It's not about uh, moving ahead, the get rich quick schemes that we see people do. It's to develop good savings habits. And you can learn some great tools and get some great tips from Navy Federal Savings Learning Center. Whether you're saving for college, for retirement, into a rainy day fund, or for long term goals, they can help you start planning. Navy Federal offers free savings accounts for your every need. So create for yourself a bucket system so that you have that emergency fund when you need it and you build your confidence. So if you want to save with a credit union that helps you build financial confidence, Find out more at NavyFederal.org. That's NavyFederal.org, insured by NCUA. Upstairs talking to mom, somebody who I've met in passing a couple times at FinCons, but we've never, for goodness knows what reason, OG, had here in the basement. She is the host of the amazing Money Girl podcast, which has been a top investing personal finance podcast for, well, for a long, long, long time. Let's say hello to our friend, Laura Adams. And on our way down to the basement, and it's about time, Laura Adams, Money Girl is here. How are you? I am awesome, and I am loving this basement. <laughs> you don't say that every day, do you? I don't. I don't go down in too many basements, but, you know, <laughs> hey, this is a special occasion. Of course, how many of us in Texas have basements? Yeah, it's true. There aren't too many. I used to live in Florida, too. There were no basements there either. <laughs> yeah, it's all it's all slaps. I got to ask you a question before we start talking about getting people out of debt more quickly. How did you become Money Girl? It's a long story. I'll make it short. I went to graduate school. I got my MBA. I was there with a lot of really smart people who were just sucky with money. I'll put it that way. They were really, you know, at the top of their game with their career, with their their company. They, you know, we're talking C-level people, multiple master's degrees, and their financial, their personal finances were just a wreck. And I thought, this is something, you know, something's not right here. This is just, uh, it doesn't make sense to me. So when I started down this road of learning about corporate finance, I really found that personal finance was way more interesting to me and way more practical. After I got my degree, I thought, I'm going to start doing some blogging. And at first, it was corporate and personal. And of course, the big response that I got was was personal. People had loads of questions. And so I had done a little bit of education, not only in school, but it had also been kind of a student of personal finance my whole life. Like I just have been fascinated with money and, and love managing money ever since I was really young. So I started blogging. The blog turned into a podcast. The podcast turned into being invited to be a part of the Quick and Dirty Tips Network, which was Money Girl. And we were really early days. I mean, we're talking 2008. I've been podcasting, though, since 2007. So right after the new year, it's going to be 12 years for me, which I can't even believe. But that Quick and Dirty Tips Network really launched Money Girl because I was able to write a book after they were acquired by Macmillan. So they got me to write a book under that brand. And that really began a whole big platform talking to people on a much bigger, broader scale. It's funny when you talk about, and, and by the way, that is a long circuitous route, becoming money girl, by the way. But going back to your corporate days, why is it that so many people make so many awesome decisions about their money at work? And then they come home and forget like all these rules that work really well at work would also work at home. Like we forget all of them, Laura. I know it's crazy and it, I still don't really understand it. And I, I think there are a lot of people that believe that it is just going to quote work itself out one day. 
So they think, yeah, I can have a lot of debt right now. And, and when I make the big bucks down the road, I'll just pay it all off and everything will work out just fine. And that's rarely what happens, right? It's so funny you say that because I'm thinking if you don't have the skills now, like what's going to change? Like what what skills are you going to bring to the table later that you're not using today? Like why not develop those today? Absolutely. So it just kind of began a journey for me to help people understand the best ways that I knew how, how to get those those messages. And and some of them are very simple, right? It's it's earning more than you spend, you know, it's planning for the future, putting a little bit away consistently over a long period of time. A lot of very simple messages that for some reason people don't implement. So I'm trying to get people to implement these very simple things, you know, by kind of knocking them over the head every once in a while <laughs> with, with some of these messages. Well, you don't knock them over the head. I mean, you're very calm and gentle and happy, which I think is why you have so many people that listen to the show. But let's get people out of debt. So let me start here. You talk about tackling debt in the right order. Like a lot of people tackle debt in the wrong order. What, how do we put our debt in the right order to get it done faster? When I've talked to people about debt, this is the biggest point of confusion. It's like, where do I even start? I think people get hung up on it. I would say, hey, just get started, you know, do what you can. But if you can do it in the right order, you're going to be much more efficient. So I like to look at debt in terms of short-term debt and long-term debt. Long-term debt are things like mortgages, maybe a student loan, things you've got over perhaps 10, 15 years into the future, those long debts. They're typically the least worrisome because they're usually fairly inexpensive and they usually come with a tax deduction that makes them even cheaper. So I like to focus on short-term debt first. So what are those? Well, for most of us, it's credit card debt, right? And it could be debt in the double digits uh, in terms of interest rate. Um, maybe it's a payday loan. Maybe it's a very expensive auto loan that you got. So looking at those short-term debts, consumer debt or loans that are short-term, those are typically costing you the most. So I like to start there. At that point, do you prefer the, you know, everybody gets in, for people who don't get into the weeds yet, there's these two methods. One's called the avalanche method, where you look at the interest rate first, and then there's the snowball method where you put the balances in order. Do you have an opinion about which one of those is better? I tend to tell people to do it mathematically. So I tend to look at the highest interest rates first. However, I would say that if you have a lower interest rate debt that is just keeping you up at night, you know, you just can't sleep because you've got $1,000 left on your fairly low interest student loan, I would never deprive you of the joy of, of <laughs> knocking that one out. So I do think that it is personal, it is emotional. You can use mathematics as a guide, but let your emotions also take you where they need to go just to make you happier about your situation. Know yourself first. Yeah, absolutely. And and I've done that. I've had little bits of, of debt here and there that really weren't that expensive, but I just kind of wanted to clean the plate and simplify and get rid of accounts. And so I said, yeah, okay, I'll pay that one off first, but then I go back to high interest. So I think we just have to keep in mind that the high interest debts are the ones costing the most. So you, if you can knock those out, you free up more money in order to pay off more debt faster. You talk about systems to prioritize your debt and not just put them in the right order, but prioritizing, I don't know, your payments. Is there, is there any magic to that area? Well, there certainly can be, you know, it really depends on on how much debt you've got. I like to really try to look at what you can negotiate. If you're behind on payments, if you're really in a hardship, really looking at what you can negotiate. Uh, sometimes that's a really good place to start. But there are also a lot of other ways. If you, Let's say you're not behind on your payments, but you've just got more than you're comfortable with. You could even begin a payment system like, paying on your mortgage every other week, like a bi-weekly system to get ahead and pay that down. Now, I don't encourage paying off a mortgage unless you have all your other debt taken care of, because 
in a you know the broader sense, the mortgage is probably one of the better debts that we can have. I really like, I actually like having a mortgage. Um, I'm not one of these people that says you should have no debt, you know, wipe it all out. I do believe that debt can help you finance things like a home, maybe even education that can help you earn more. So I'm not one of those people that believes that we should have zero debt. I truly believe that it can help you leverage yourself and it can help you build wealth if you use debt wisely. When you call your mortgage company and you're going to make biweekly payments, do you have, you know, there's fees to use their system. Can you, do you have to use their system or can you set that up on your own? Yeah, it's kind of a scam, I think, that they make you pay money to pay your own debt (laughs) off earlier, right? That really doesn't make sense to me. So I don't encourage you to sign up for some silly prepayment program. I would definitely encourage contacting them, though, what they will often try to do is when you pay a, you pay extra, they try to just put it in an escrow account as if you were paying early instead of applying that extra to pay down the principal, right? So you have to be very clear with them. And maybe you make a note on your payment, whether it's a, an online payment or you're writing a check. Uh, You can even make it in the memo on your online payment that this is for principal and, you know, it's not to just be held in escrow until the next month. So you do have to be, you have to watch them because they definitely don't want you to prepay, right? Because that means it's, it's going to be less profitable for them. So it's in your best interest to contact them and let them know, hey, I'm doing this. What do you need on your end to make sure this gets applied properly? I've seen that with student loans. Well, you probably have too. With student loans, they'll do the same thing. If you don't tell them what to do, they will apply evenly to four different student loans, even though it matches exactly what you owe on one of the loans. And it's very clear that um, I've had people even explicitly say, hey, I want to apply this to this loan. And they still apply it to, you know, four different student loans. Yeah, you do have to watch lenders because, again, it's not in their best interest to pay off your debt faster. So, you know, as consumers, we always have to watch out for ourselves. You know, it's all about being the squeaky wheel and it's all about watching out for your best interests and knowing that you are, you know, you're competing with the lender. They're trying to make money off of you and you're trying to do everything that you can to save money and pay them as little as possible. I want to ask you a quick question, and I don't want to get too far in the weeds with this, but about negotiating on your debt. Are there some specific words to say when you call up the credit card company or the whatever the lender is and you want to negotiate with them? I do think that you have to come from a point of strength. And you do have to let them know, well, you've got to be friendly, first of all. You've got to be friendly because you're just going to be able to work with them in a much better way if you're kind and you're not trying to, you know, get angry on the phone. I do think you have to let them know that they're probably not going to get paid unless they negotiate with you. I mean, really, you've got to be strong about it because they're going to want to get something from you rather than nothing from you, right? So, you know, in in some cases, you may have to bluff a little bit about, you know, maybe, you know, your hardship is maybe a little bit more of a hardship than it really is. You do have to come from a point of negotiation with them. Uh, Otherwise, they're just going to, you know, kind of insist that you make the payment. They're going to keep on adding late fees and interest. I'd imagine at that point, you're not even worried about your credit anymore. I mean, if you're at the point where you're negotiating, does that hurt your credit anymore? If you are already late on payments, your credit has already been hurt. So at that point, you know, you really have to make a decision about, do I want to pay this debt? Do I not want to pay this debt? Or do I want to negotiate this debt? You've got three options. I always believe that if you take on a debt, it is your moral responsibility to repay it. Now, a lot of people don't agree with that. And, you know, I'm of the mindset that you should pay what you borrow. So if you are in a situation where you've got hardship, you truly cannot pay the debt, that's when you should negotiate. I I don't believe in just trying to negotiate, even if you have the ability to pay a debt. But if you truly have a hardship, you're truly behind and it's for a good reason, you're in a position to negotiate and to look out for your best interest. You've got two debts. One is in collections. One is not in collections. You have enough money to pay one of those two. Which one do you pay first or does it matter? 
Yeah, it's a good question. It really is, because if you're already in collections, you definitely have had your credit harmed. I would probably go for the one in collections if it is relatively recent. So let's say, you know, you're in collections because you're six months, nine months behind. I'd probably go for that one first. Now, if it's been in collections for years, I would probably be more likely to let that one sit and and work on the one that's not in collections yet. I want to ask very quickly just about three different ways to pay down credit card debt and get your feeling about these different ways of paying down, like maybe quick pros and cons. Balance transfers on credit cards. You see these all the time. Hey, transfer it over here, 0% interest for six months. What do you think about those? They can be wise if you truly know that you can pay off the balance in full by the time the promotion ends. What happens is that these 0% offers look so great that we go, oh, yes, we're going to transfer everything over here. And then we forget and the offer expires. Interest rate goes back up. Maybe even it's a little higher than it was before we took the offer to begin with. And so you end up kind of negating all of the, the goodness that you were trying to get out of doing that offer in the first place. So so if you've got a smart plan, so it's a, if it's a 12-month promotion, you're going to pay one-twelfth of that balance every single month. Um, so you whittle it down, and by the 12th month, you're down to zero. If you can do that, they're the best thing going. What do you think about changing it over to a consolidation or a personal loan instead? That can work, too. You know, the problem there is that you get your loan, and then you just go back to the credit card, and you start uh, charging it again. <laughs> yeah. Behavior right? gets in the way again. It can happen. So if you are truly disciplined and you say, you know what, I'm not going to use that credit card anymore, and you really focus on that 36-month personal loan, that consolidation, they can be a great way to get that debt uh, taken care of and done. I want to ask this because, you know, just based on that answer, Laura, a lot of this is an effect. I mean, the, the fact that you would take out a personal loan and then start charging on the credit card shows that for a lot of us, the reason we got in debt in the first place was because we didn't have these great systems. Let's talk for a second about staying out of debt in the first place. Where do we start on that front? Yeah, so I do think that a lot of people simply don't know how much they earn. They literally don't know how much they're making or what they're spending. So looking at your life in terms of a spending plan, I tend not to say budget because budget sounds like a diet, <laughs> something of you know deprivation, but we're all going to spend money, right? So let's have a spending plan instead. So if you can break it down and really see where your money is going, for a lot of people, even that is so eye-opening. And they go, whoa, I, you know, I am spending more than I'm making, and that excess is going on the credit card. So if you can truly have a zero, you know, a, a wipe it out, zero-based budgeting is what they call it, and make a home for every bit of your money, and part of that's got to be savings, part of that's got to be retirement, got to work that into the spending plan, that's typically the only way I know not to go into debt. Do you like using technology to help? Do you like any of these apps that are out there? I have tried so many different things. And for me, I have I have just come back to Quicken over and over and over. It, it's just my go-to. I like to categorize. I like to create budgets within Quicken. And I'll be honest, I'm not a big budgeter uh, myself. I kind of have a top-down approach. I say if I can save what I need to be saving for retirement, if I have what I need in my emergency fund, kind of those big, what I call big rocks are taken care of, I really don't care what I spend. Yeah. You know, as long as what I have left over is I'm not going over that amount, I take care of the big things first, and then I can spend what's left over really any way I want. That's a good point. If you're not going over, who cares? I mean, live your life. Yeah, it's kind of a top-down approach yeah. rather than looking at it from the bottom up. So if you can do that, if you got all of those sort of big financial goals accounted for, you know, maybe you don't need to be budgeting every penny. It's really no fun. It's not something that people can do sustainably. It might be something that you can do to work through a hardship and kind of get your finances back on track. And believe me, there have been times in my life where I've done that. I've budgeted to the penny to get back on track. But then once you're there and, you know, you, you've got a system in place to take care of those big goals goals, the budgeting can come, you know, secondary, it can really be a backseat. That's fantastic. Your book is called Debt-Free Blueprint, How to Get Out of Debt and Build a Financial Life You Love. We just covered 
about one, I don't know, one one hundred and fiftieth of all the stuff that's in that's packed packed in your book. What made you want to write this book? I get asked about debt a lot. And I do think that it's one of the issues that can hold you back from achieving your financial goals. Yeah. So, if, you know, if you can handle debt and really get get your arms around it, your financial life just really opens up. I mean, the world is, is your oyster. But if you're held back by debt, you're not going to be saving for retirement. You're not going to be building an emergency fund. And you're probably going to feel stuck in your job and not feel like you can branch out and do other things. Maybe that's applying for another job or starting a business or a side gig. So I think there are just so many downsides to debt that I just wanted to give people some clear guidelines and options to work on it, you know, in, in a way that is realistic. I love how you you talked about it as being a hurdle and not a goal. I mean, one of the, you know, we all have these little semantic things that we don't like. I always disagree with people when they say, well, my goal is to get out of debt. Well, no, goal is your hurdle. And I find that once people get out of debt, if they don't have any real goals, like, you know, financial independence or buying a cottage or, or you know, whatever it might be, putting kids through college, whatever it might be, if you don't have any other goals, the second you get out of debt, I find people get right back into debt because they didn't have any real thing they were striving for. So I love this as a place to start. Yeah, Joe, that's so true. And I, I do think that when people begin to think about money in terms of just a tool to do what you want in life, yeah. to achieve those goals, then you see it in a, in a whole different way. And you begin to become almost addicted to saving instead of being addicted to spending. So you just shift your priorities, maybe sometimes from things, uh, buying consumer goods to what is the ultimate goal? You know, do I want to travel? Do I want to uh, leave my job early, retire early? All these things that really fires us up and gets ex us excited. That sometimes is also the key to getting out of debt. The book again, Debt-Free Blueprint, How to Get Out of Debt and Build the Financial Life You Love. Where do we get it, Laura? You can get it anywhere, of course, at Amazon. It's also on iBooks, Barnes & Noble, all those great places. You also have to tell us what fun new stuff is coming up on the Money Girl podcast. Yeah, you know, I do a lot of shows about topics that either are questions that come in to me, things maybe that I just know, you know, trending, things that even things that I want to learn about. The show for me is a lot about just continuing my education and sharing that education with other people. So, you know, a lot of good things on the horizon. And um, I would encourage people to send me a question. If you've got concerns, issues, questions, I love getting questions and addressing them on the show. It is such a fun show and you often go on my runs with me. So thanks for doing that, making the pain a little less. I appreciate that. Laura, thanks for hanging out with us in the basement. It's about time we got you here. I'd like to get you out of the basement and maybe you can come on Money Girl. Oh, boy, I will wreck that show in a heartbeat. So let's do it. Sounds great. Hey there, trivia fans. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And if Laura Adams has you inspired to start working toward a debt-free life, here's some bad news. Things might not go well sometimes during your journey to the promised land, but today is the anniversary of the first flight of the Wright Brothers Flyer. And those were two guys who, like you during your debt payoff journey, took their lumps and kept on trying until they succeeded. Here's a trivia question. How did the Wright Brothers decide who would go up in the air first? I'll have your answer right after this. Raised in a trailer park with no clear path to success, kicked out of high school multiple times, and faced with becoming a father in his teens, Jason Waller is the definition of a true underdog. After hearing the words no or you can't too many times, he unleashed the power within to start three successful companies with his most recent venture, Power Home Solar, skyrocketing on a path to become a billion dollar enterprise. So join us as Waller, four time Entrepreneur of the Year winner, shares motivational tips and inspiring stories and business building lessons from the ground up. He shares his life experiences and that of his high profile guests to help others better themselves. As Waller will tell you, there's no elevators to success and that climb only happens one step at a time stackers. Let every true underdog podcast be that step that elevates you scared money, 
won't make money. Learn about failure. Learn about entrepreneurship. Learn about never quitting or making excuses. It's real. It's raw. It's motivational. Check out True Underdog Podcast at trueunderdog.com or wherever you're listening to us right now. Hey, stackers, pay your credit cards off in full every month. Well, if so, you may know that any credit card can offer cash back, but only discover matches all the cash back you've earned at the end of your first year. It's like getting one of those birthday cards that's shaped like cash. So you already know there's cash inside before you open it. But in this case, it's stuffed with your first year cash back match and you don't even have to send a thank you note. Cash back match only by Discover card. Learn more at discover.com slash match. Discover something brighter. Welcome back, Trivia fans. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. Before the break, I asked you this question. How did the Wright brothers decide who would go up in the air first? The answer, the two brothers tossed a coin. Of course, how else would they do it? Well, if it were my brothers, they'd punch me in the face. But anyway, they tossed a coin. Who won the bet? Well, it was the older brother, Wilbur, of course. I'm sure that wasn't rigged. Anyway, much like debt payoff strategies, Things didn't go perfect the first time. After Wilbur's first attempt, going airborne caused some minor damage to the aircraft. Orville, in a coat and tie, looking mighty dapper, took to the skies a few days later. And on today's date, back in 1903, at 10.35 in the morning, the right flyer left the ground for a whole 12 seconds. The brothers took turns after that three more times with longer and longer flights until Wilbur's final ascent lasted nearly a minute and covered a distance of 852 feet. Planning, failing, tweaking, and learning put them into the history books. Come on, if they can do that, your credit card debt is super easy by comparison. Go get it! See ya! I've never read about the Wright brothers dynamic. I probably should sometimes, but do you think there's like one brother who is all into it? And the other one who's like, nah, okay, we'll do your stupid contraption again. Wow. That's a little passive aggressive, but okay. Yeah, sure. <laughs> no, but you, seems like, seems like <laughs> in any partnership, you got one person who's like, go, go, go. The other one who struggles to get to the microphone. Oh, did I say microphone? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I did, how did that come out? Nice. Okay. That was, was absolutely was up weird. and at him this morning. I even remembered that we were doing a podcast today. That was awesome. Thanks to Laura Adams for stopping by the basement. Hey, though, let's start with Haven Lifeline OG. We're going to tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency know that this is the time of year where you put what you value first. Let me tell you a little secret. If you didn't catch it before, make peanut butter blossoms. You know what those cookies are, right? They're like the little peanut butter cookies with Hershey Kisses in the middle. Make them with Biscoff spread instead of peanut butter. Go online, find the recipe. Biscoff instead of peanut butter. It will change your world. So that's my number one thing. Because I can eat them like three at a time. Just Mrs. OG cannot make enough of these things. That's actually what it says here in the in the script. Uh, Biscoff, 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 Biscoff cookies, your loved ones, and your time. All three yeah. of those things. Yeah, that's what you value. It's oh, they're so good, Joe. It's why you might they, even get one if you come over for Christmas. Here's what you do: go do the Haven Life application first. Yeah, my my blood sugar was just a skosh <laughs> high. <laughs> and then do that. It's why Haven Life is made buying quality term life insurance actually simple. Head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash Haven Life now for your free quote. Great time of year, by the way, to get your life insurance in order. Let's say hello on the Haven Lifeline today to our new friend, Alexander. Hey, Joe and OG. Hope you guys are well. Had some questions for you. My wife and I are mid 30s. We have yet to start my career as a physician. I'm currently in residency right now, and I had some kind of general questions for you. We have a Roth IRA, both of us, and with the way that the market's been going lately, I'm wondering if it's advisable to pull out funds from you know the VTSAX to put into the money market account on the 
retirement account and then reinvest that when the market drops. You know, I've seen a lot of volatility lately. I feel like your answer is going to be no and stop acting like I have superpowers to <laughs> predict the market. But I just wanted to throw it out there and see your thoughts. And I'm curious if you've ever had that same temptation. Two more questions. We've effectively dropped my tax liability to zero while I'm not making a huge amount of income and funding tax sheltered accounts. I'm wondering with our taxable account if we should tax gain harvest during this time. And finally, after tax gain harvesting, I'm wondering if I should tax lost harvest now or later as an attending. Thanks, guys. All right. A couple of good tax questions there, but let's talk about Alexander becoming Nostradamus and deciding when the right time to pull out of the market is. You know, every time that I think that we've reached capacity and we've served every person that we've ever possibly served, then Alexander totally comes out of nowhere and makes it so that we've got to go to work tomorrow. So that's fantastic. Yeah. All of what he said is true. Don't try to predict this stuff because you will end up losing in the long run because you got to be right twice. That's the problem. When do you know that the market's going to go down 20%? When it's down 20%. Even the day that it was down 19.9 in 2011, everybody said, well, here comes the bear market. Officially starts tomorrow. Never hit it. And all the people who just cashed everything in, I think a lot of this has to do with understanding what is the range of returns that's expected for your portfolio. So I think that it's really important to recognize that it's okay to make changes, but you make changes when there's an, there, there's a variability beyond what's expected. So if you have money in the S and P 500 fund, or you have money in the total market index or whatever, you have to understand that the average decline in any given year is 14.5%. That's the average. Before you get to 14.5% is not average yet. You're actually lowering the average. If that's the, if that's the biggest decline you had this year from hot, top to bottom in any one calendar year was 10, you're not even to the average thing yet. So that should be kind of threshold one on your radar screen of if you look at your investment accounts monthly or you look at them every quarter, if you mentally put in your mind, okay, I got a hundred grand, I would be average if this thing saw 86 today. So framing it in the context of what is normal really, really, really helps. So don't do anything like take your money out, put it in the money market. Just I would look at though, I like playing volatility, but I think there's a different game that people don't think about, OG, which is you're talking about volatility. Well, you're not talking about it. He's talking about volatility as if it's his enemy. Let's talk about volatility as your flipping buddy. And how do you find a way to make sure that you take advantage of the volatility? And I think that pulling out now and trying to play the guessing game is far more volatility's enemy than volatility's friend, where maximizing your investments into whatever your investment of choice is during this time as it goes down just makes a ton more sense to me. Well, the other thing that happens, I think, automatically as you build your investment portfolio is you automatically buy and sell by rebalancing at peaks and valleys, you know, along the way. So, so if you're thinking about rebalancing your investment portfolio right now and you had, you started the year with 60% of your money in U.S. stocks and 40% of your money in international stocks, well, guess what? That 40% is down 22-ish percent, to, depending on what, you know, what fund and how aggressive you were. Well, the U.S. market, despite everybody's assertion that it's gone down a whole bunch, is, you know, up for the year, at least when we're recording this. So what effectively are you doing when you rebalance? You're taking something that has profited, or at least not gone down as much in some cases, but is over the allocation, you're automatically buying the things that are lower. That's using, Joe, to your point, volatility is your buddy. Do you like this idea of tax gain harvesting? Well, I guess I never thought about it, but I suppose if you had some 
really large gain position or something like that. Like he bought a thousand shares of Amazon in 1996 or something. And you've been sitting on it this whole time and you're up to like $11 million. And you're like, damn, what do I do? I've got $11 million of capital gains. So maybe you peel off 10 grand of that and say, okay, well, I get to get that long-term capital gain tax free. The key here though is capital gains tax though, Alexander, I think he's trying to maximize the fact that he's in a very low tax bracket now, going to be at a higher tax bracket later. Yeah. Capital gains yeah. tax is a different tax. Well, and it's much lower. I think that's his point, is that you can get a little bit of it at zero, and then you can get a little bit kind of in the middle ground, and then it maxes out at 20, which is still less than most earned income tax brackets. You know, never let the tax tail wag the dog. But if you have the opportunity to take a gain and rebalance it, because maybe you were foolish and bought an individual stock and it actually turned out okay... And you're like, how do I get out of this without shooting myself in the foot? I think the biggest thing to recognize is that with capital gains, you're going to pay some money generally, but you pay one fifth of the money that you gained. You know, that's the price of being successful. Congratulations. You should be so like, I wish someday that I have a million dollar capital gain tax bill because that means that I made five million dollars that year. That's not a bad day. One thing that I worry about, actually, is along a different line than what Alexander was talking about, which is the volatility recently. We do know that year after year, for a lot of, frankly, pretty good reasons, there's this thing they call the Santa Claus rally. And so I worry, I do worry about taking money out of the market during that and then the beginning of the next year, which in a lot of years are phenomenal weeks for the market. So I think if you're going to do it, do it fast. Like, get it done now. Minimize the time that you're the time that you're out of the market. I'm not that worried about timing, but I do worry about some specific weeks during the year. And these are some weeks when in most years, historically, you don't really want to be out of the market. On the tax loss harvesting side, what you're talking about here is taking positions that have gone down in value and kind of banking them for the future, whether or not you use them right now to offset the gain or you use them for kind of putting them in your back pocket. You can carry forward any number of losses and then you spread it out over you know, $3,000 increments from that point forward. That's not bad, but I would only do it if it's a real sizable amount. I'm not interested in tax loss harvesting 350 bucks. It takes more time than it is worth the, the payoff there, so to speak. So the biggest thing to remember there is be aware of wash sale rules. So if you don't know what that is, you have to look that up. So don't do that. And then you don't want to keep your money in cash during that 30-day period, those 31 days. You want to find something that's similar that you can invest money because like you said earlier, you don't want to be out of the market for 30 days just to benefit from some tax play. And of course the 30 days you're out of the market is the 30 days the market goes up 6% and (laughs) it's just been better to take your tax losses. Thanks for the question, Alexander. If you've got a question for the show, you know what? Alexander's taking home the greatest money show on earth t-shirt. Free shirt. T-shirt. Merry Christmas. StackyBenjamins.com forward slash voicemail to do that. Very easy to leave a message on the Haven Lifeline. We don't actually have time for a letter from the mailbag. I know we promised that, but I'm looking at the clock and I think uh, we're going to have to do. Alexander hogged so much time. Our letter. Hope he's happy. I think we got to do our letter. Better go save some lives today, dude. (laughs) Make it happen. (laughs) That's going to do it for today. Thanks to everybody for listening. Thank you to everybody who's left a review of this here podcast. OG, thanks to you for hanging out. Doug, take it from here, man. What should we have learned today? So what did we learn today? Well, first, we learned from Laura Adams, a.k.a. Money Girl, that there are many strategies available to pay down your debt. Find yours find accountability partners, and stick to your plan. Second, thanks to Matthew Comos at TransUnion, we know that credit is going to be more plentiful than ever. Don't let the fear of missing out on things you don't really need derail your long-term and probably way more awesome plans. But the big lesson? Don't let Gertrude pick the basement secret Santas. I ended up with OG again and shopping for that guy. Holy cow. Let's just say that his Lamborghini tastes and my smart car budget aren't quite lining up this year. Special thanks to Laura Adams, a.k.a. Money Girl, for joining us. You'll find her book, Debt-Free Blueprint, wherever books are sold. And you'll find the Money Girl podcast wherever you're listening to the dulcet tones of my voice. 
Thanks also to Matthew Como, Senior Vice President of Research and Consulting at TransUnion, for joining us today. You'll find their 2019 credit report at transunion.com. This show was created by Joe Saul Cihai, produced by Richie Rutter Reese, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at, at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and there's a 73% chance that I played Chuck on Happy Days. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remuneration. There's no way you would take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only, and before making any financial moves, consult with a real financial advisor. Special thanks to Joe's mom for bringing scented candles down to the basement. Nothing says podcasting with a bunch of dudes like scented candles. I have a feeling that between us, we're going to have a lot of movie reviews coming up. This is one that uh, I actually saw over the Thanksgiving weekend. Uh, so it's been a little while, but I actually just had friends to go see this as late as this last weekend. These are written by a little known author named J.K. What is it? Rowling? Rowling? Something? Don't know. Never J- saw a single one. J.K. Moneybags? Yeah, now. J.K. Tons of Cash? Uh, this is Fantastic Beasts, The Crimes of Grindelwald. An address. What's that? A safe house in Paris. Why would I need a safe house in Paris? Should things at some point go terribly wrong, it's good to have a place to go. You know, for a cup of tea. My brothers. My sisters. The clock is ticking fast. My dream, we who live for truth, for love. The moment has come to take our rightful place in the world where we wizards were free. Join me or die. The wizarding and non-wizarding worlds have been at peace for over a century. Grindelwald wants to see that peace destroyed. You want me to hunt him down? To kill him? Dumbledore, why can't you go? I cannot move against Grindelwald. It has to be you. You don't suffer from motion sickness, see? I don't do well on boats. You'll be fine. Wow! And they disappear into a pail and uh, into another another realm. Of course, this is the second movie in the Fantastic B series. The new series based in the United States, starring Eddie Redmayne as Newt Scamander. And, of course, you heard a lot in that trailer, Johnny Depp as the bad guy, Grindelwald. You said you haven't read or seen any of the Harry Potter stuff. Not a single one. Correct. See, those seem to be right up your alley. They're so fun. It's so magical. I thought that even the Mm. theme park stuff at Universal are amazing. Nope. Don't do it. I don't do sci-fi stuff. But Wicked is your favorite musical. That's real. Oh, I forgot. The first movie in this series. No, Wicked is my favorite story of all time. But you you haven't even given these stories a, a shot. You're right. There's only so many hours in the day, Joe. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, as many people have read these, I'm sure they're all wrong. I'm sure they're probably horrible. Uh, <laughs> the, 
the f- why would I watch this when like, you know, I could rewatch Bad Boys Two. Good point. Or Heat, or any of the you could watch Rambo's. that awesome movie I watched this summer, Uncle Drew again. I didn't see that one. Well, you should watch that one because the that Expendables. Was pre- any of those would be satisfactory to watch on repeat. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you. The first movie in this series was fantastic, as was, I think, a lot of people that I knew, with the exception of OG, the notable exception of OG. Super excited to see this. The bad news is, is that uh, if you look at the Rotten Tomato score, I thought, well, Rotten Tomato scores for this type of movie, of course, it's all the OG syndrome, right? Oh, it's Harry Potter. I'm a serious critic. I'm going to knock it down. Almost like when you go see, when you go see a comedy if it has a 55% Rotten Tomato score, that's pretty good. That's that's not bad. There's a good chance you're probably going to laugh your head off. Well, sadly, with this one, I did not laugh. I didn't cry. I didn't care. It was a beautiful movie. The bad news is the movie's full of exposition and needed a good editor. And I get the feeling that J.K. Rowling's influence on this is probably so big that nobody wanted to go, you know, why don't we edit this down a little bit? Because any movie where the characters stand around telling you about all the things that you need to know before they do the next scene, I'm not an action guy like you are, but let's go blow something up. And there's plenty of stuff blowing up here. There's plenty of cool things happening, but there's so many times where the characters are explaining story points that it feels like a movie just trying to get me to the next one. You know, so the first one was great. The second one's just, yeah, there's all these plot points we got to shove in this movie so that in the next one we can get back to actually showing you stuff again instead of telling you. The movie's all about showing you, you know, you're feeling stuff with them. I didn't feel anything. I felt like I felt bored. I thought it was an incredibly. See, there you go. It was an incredibly boring movie. I see. I knew that before I even went to it. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I and saved after- myself 13 bucks and. Another 22 in popcorn, and I got to watch Expendables 2 again. And after I gave you the whole passive-aggressive thing, too. Yeah, see, it's a win-win. I still come back with a... I got to remember... They to pick, call me Mr. Covey 2.0. I got to remember win-win. to win-win. pick my battles uh, when I'm about <laughs> to have that battle, because that didn't end well for me. Yeah, Fantastic Beast, the second one. If you're a completionist on this series, there was no way I wasn't going to see it. Okay. It's funny. You don't like sci-fi, but you will go see the superhero movies. No, I don't, actually. I don't see those either anymore. But I'm you, tired of them. I'm, I'm tired of them, too. However, I did see this last week, the trailer for the Avengers, you know, final chapter thingy dingy. Mm-hmm. Did you see the last Alleged one? Alleged final chapter. No, didn't watch it. Don't Good. care. Didn't see the last Avengers. Well, the bad news is I saw I saw the first half of this of this train wreck, which, if you remember, I didn't love. Mm-hmm. But, but I feel so compelled now. I'm like, I'm halfway done. I got to go watch the, got to go watch the rest of it. So going to see it anyway. Okay. Fantastic beast. Big, I'm going to go down. see mule. See, those don't turn me on the, uh, I'm like, yeah, I don't Clint know. Eastwood? Clint Eastwood does love Clint Eastwood. Love uh, Clint Eastwood Clint in Eastwood movies. Turns you on. I just watched the, I just watch, I just watched the uh, previews and I went, yeah, no, no, yeah. no, nothing about the previews. It's like, it's like Gran Torino. Like just an old crotchety old man. Well, Gran Torino was a movie that the preview didn't get me. I'm like, yeah, I don't want to watch this. And that was one of the best movies I've ever seen. If you haven't seen Gran yeah. Torino, you've got to go see that movie. I saw a new uh, Netflix slash movie theater. So Netflix is creating a content now. Oh, well, not now. I, they've been doing it. But they're actually making a movie now. Sure. That comes out in March. It'll be on Netflix and in theaters, I guess, simultaneously. Looks to be, this is totally up my alley, of course, looks to be a whole bunch of ex, we'll just call them special forces guys, don't know, who are tired of doing it for the G and figure out that, uh, you know, there's this drug lord that's got eh, about $25 million at his house. We're going to go rob him. And allegedly it doesn't go according to plan, but it's got... Wait a minute. Are these a group of special forces guys who are accused of a crime that they didn't commit? <laughs> Dun, 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 dun. Uh, I used to love that show. The movie was good. The rehashed movie I, was I did, great. I didn't see the movie. I probably should have. Oh, you'd love it. You'd I, love it because it's I would. funny. Probably just it's camp, campy as all get out. Oh, it totally is. Yep. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm spacing on the people who are in it. The guy from uh, Sons of Anarchy is in this one. Oh, awesome. Uh, For people uh, that don't know what we're talking about, we're talking about the A-Team. So, well, that, yeah, yeah. The, the A-Team doesn't have the guy from Sons of Anarchy. It's got Liam Neeson and, like, Owen Wilson, I think. Yeah, anyway, you're, you're talking about the Netflix thing. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, Bradley I, Cooper's in a, the a new the, A-Team. The new A-Team one, yeah. Yeah, which I mean, isn't new, new now. It's, yeah, right. Yeah, it's like five or ten years old. No, that's funny. But it's good. I'm looking forward to, and you and I have had this discussion, but that Sherlock Holmes movie. Well, that looks really funny. Got to watch that. The Mary Poppins movie, of course, being a Disney guy, got to go see the Mary Hard Poppins. Or, okay. Mary Poppins Returns. Um, I also am interested in, uh, I think it looks hilarious, the favorite. Oh, I saw that one. It, it looks very funny. About this queen who seems to be an idiot and a new person comes to her court who becomes her favorite and other people are trying to convince her that this woman is just kind of, you know, robbing her blind. So they take, they take what happens in every family in America where you've got some kid who's the rich, rich mom or dad's favorite that shouldn't be. And is just completely scamming them. I mean, that's what it looks like from the trailer. I don't know if that's what it's going to be. Uh, so looking forward to that too. Good stuff. 